Well, good morning again, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Uh, we shockingly reached the end of April already. It's just, I say that I say this a lot, and I will keep saying this a lot, that time just keeps on moving. It, time does not stop for anyone. And it is, I can't believe that it's already April. Maybe because it's still kind of cold in April, I'm getting kind of tricked, and I think that time is going slower than it is, and it still kind of feels like winter, but it's the end of April, and we're, we're getting close to summer, even though I'm, I'm thankful to God that it does not feel like summer, and I'm hoping summer doesn't feel like summer either. I, I like this cold weather. I don't like sweating at 6 a.m. So, as we come into this, this book of Galatians, I'm so excited that we've finally made it. It took us like a good year to get out of that chapter in Proverbs. <laughs> and Proverbs hosts a whole bunch of fantastic things. And we're going to get back to Proverbs. Don't worry for those that want to keep going to Proverbs, because I do. Really, I want to go through every book in the Bible, if time were to permit it. Um, and we'll get back to Proverbs once we finish Galatians. Thankfully, though, Galatians only has um, six chapters. And so we will get the, through this oh, a year or something. <laughs> I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see. But we'll take a, a nice needed break from, from Proverbs. And normally, when I do my Bible studies, I've always stressed that I really like open participation. And that doesn't change with Galatians. I just want to preface that Galatians... For some parts of it, especially this opening part, we'll have a little more uh, exposition where I'm just talking. It's like I don't like to just lecture all the time, but I do need to give some context to, to Galatians so that we know where it's coming from and what's going on in the midst of Galatians because Galatians is a, a fantastic book. It's actually considered by many theologians. It's called the, the Magna Carta of Christian liberty, <laughs> and that's because it's something that is so loudly and so clearly expresses the, the new covenant grace that we, we know and that we are in, and that comes through faith in, in Christ Jesus alone. And Galatians uh, is kind of like a, it goes hand in hand with Romans. Galatians and Romans go, go hand in hand because Paul, who is the author of this, starts off in Galatians and he starts talking about grace. He starts talking about uh, the justification through our faith and this is expounded on more in Romans as well. But Galatians is a fantastic book and there are a lot of authors, uh, including, not an author, but there is a lot of theologians and a lot of just pastors and a lot of just individuals in the church that have absolutely adored this book, where there's even Martin Luther, a uh, very famous man, <laughs> the guy who pounded all those things on the, the door that one time. Um, I'm going to paraphrase this quote, but he said something along the lines of, like, the book of Galatians, I'm married to it, I'm betrothed to it, this book is everything I need, because <laughs> he just absolutely love the book of Galatians. It is a fantastic book that explains uh, the new covenant and what Christ has done so clearly. And so, definitely feel free when, as I'm continuing to talk, feel free as, whenever I've led Bible study to, to ask questions, feel free to, to share comments, feel free to share any anecdotes or related stories that you might have, even though this will be a little more context heavy this time around. Um, I still very deeply value the conversation, the communication, and the ideas that are spawned out of this, because I alone don't have all the answers. <laughs> I never will. I'm thankful that I don't have all the answers and that we need to yield to God. And not only that, but God intended it for us to be able to learn from one another. He didn't intend for us to read the Bible in a vacuum. <laughs> he didn't intend us to read scripture all by ourselves and have only our own understanding. But the, but the Spirit of God has revelations that come throughout time and history and through individuals where something just made sense to them and they explain it. And that made sense to other people 
and then they go off and explain it more, and that makes sense to more people. And that's how God intended to be very communal. God didn't intend us to be alone. God intended, did not intend for us to do anything by ourselves, including read scripture. He doesn't want us our entire life by ourselves reading scripture. He wants us interacting with our brothers and sisters, talking to them, discussing things, figuring things out, grappling with things in scripture. Because at the end of it, and one thing that I absolutely love is that at the very end of it, no matter how smart someone is, no matter how many degrees they have, there's no one that can say, I know it all. And one of the, the people I, I definitely look up to is uh, Dr. Mike Morrison. He's the, the dean of Grace Communion Seminary, and i uh, known him my, almost in my entire life. And one of the most comforting things, because as I've said in his name, he's a, a doctor, he got his doctorate in theology, because he absolutely loves the Bible. And it's so comforting to hear from someone as educated and as humble as he is to say, I don't know. Because <laughs> there have been lots of times in the past where I've asked him questions and he's like, I don't know. I'll have to look up on that. <laughs> and it's so comforting to know not even a guy who spend, who is paid and spends a hard majority of his time studying scripture. Yeah. There's lots of things he just doesn't know. <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah. That is completely okay. And so there are definitely, there will be some things I don't know. There will be some things that I haven't uh, explicitly studied. <laughs> and that's okay. What matters most is Christ. And that's something that we all do know. We all know Christ and what he did for us. And at the very end of it, that's the reason. That's the reason why we study. That's the reason why we discuss it. And that's what all of this is about. Who Christ Jesus is and what he's done for humanity. So getting into it. Um, so, of course, this is written by Paul. One of the, the interesting, more technical things that's curious about this for those that like to know the little, some tidbits of information. This doesn't affect uh, our understanding of Galatians and for it's the normal person like you or I. Uh, this really doesn't change anything, but for theologians, they, they really take this to, to heart. But the uh, this, the specific Pauline epistle of Galatians is so distinctly Paul that it's actually the standard in which other epistles are judged against. And what I mean by that is there are lots of script, or there's lots of books in the Bible where they are written either by someone who we aren't sure who was written by, like Hebrews. People still to this day aren't 100 percent sure who wrote Hebrews. Or there are other epistles by Paul where people aren't 100% sure if it was like handwritten by Paul. Because what would happen a lot in scripture is people would have a scribe. And they would talk out everything. And the scribe would write it all down. And then the person speaking it, or the person that authorized them to write about this book, they would read it over and they'd say like, yeah, this is good. And they would sign their name. And they would say like, this is by me. And that was very common in the day. And so, Galatians, almost unanimously, people believe, was handwritten by Paul. In the themes, in the way he talks, everything about it says that this is Paul. And so, this is the most authentic form of him when we get into this book. And this is why this book is used as a standard against when they judge other Pauline epistles. They say, like, well, let's compare this to Galatians in the tone, in the themes, in his use of certain vocabulary, this and that. Is this really Paul? It's compared to Galatians. And so I say all that to say that Galatians is an important book. It has a lot of gravity when we look at it. Uh, so this was written in 50 AD. And this is give or take because it's like there's not an exact date. This is like 15 to 20 years after the crucifixion of Christ. And this is after Paul has... Uh, gone through at least two missionary trips, and churches have been planted, and he's writing this all of Galatians because he went, and this church in Galatia really, for a lot of the churches, he preached the, the gospel of Jesus Christ and what happens in most of the churches, and still happens today, is people come in, and they start spreading their false gospel, they start bleeding in certain things that don't really mix with what Paul
Paul is preaching. And in this case, it was the Judaizers. And these are uh, Jewish Christians. And these are people who have many Jewish cultures and many Jewish traditions that they still really are holding on to very strictly. They're holding on to this, and they believe X, Y, and Z are necessary for salvation. They believe one has to obey Mosaic and Jewish law for salvation, which is not the case. And so they came in there, and they're preaching this. They go in there like, oh yeah, we're Christians, and uh, we believe in Jesus Christ, and sit down in the, the audience with these people, and get to know them, and then they'll start seeping in these things. And it's insidious how they would do it. And it still happens today. It still happens in lots of churches. Unfortunately, that's how you get uh, really odd cults. <laughs> that's how you get very, very odd cults. People slip in and they say some things and people are curious about it and they buy into it and then they just get swept away. And so Paul was aware of this. He was aware of what was going on. This happened in several of his churches. And that's why when we look at Galatians as a whole, it is very, it is a doctrinally oriented book. And it is very clear cut compared to some of his other writings and what he's trying to state about Christ Jesus. He's trying to very, very, very clearly refute the things that have been said. He's trying to refute all these Jewish customs that have been trying to seep in. And he's trying to proclaim this is who Christ is. And as I said before, this is also like a precursor to Romans once we, whenever we get into that book. Galatians is a precursor and is even more expounded the, the concept of grace and justification through faith in Romans. And what made this book so curious, or not curious, but controversial in its time. Nowadays it's not controversial, but what made this so controversial in its time is that it was so radically different than what people were hearing, because Jewish custom was very common back in that day. A lot of people were Jews <laughs> back then. And that culture and all the, the many hundreds of laws, as well as the Mosaic laws that were there, were very well known. And so when Paul comes in and stating all these things, it is upsetting for people to hear. They're like, we all of our life have heard that we need to obey Mosaic law. We've heard that we need to obey all these traditions. We need to do all these things for salvation. And you're saying we don't? That is so upsetting because it's like your entire life has been built upon something that is now obsolete. And it's so world shattering for these people to hear. And so this book is transformative in everything that it proclaims. And when we break it down, there are three major things that Paul is trying to communicate across this entire book. The first is he wants to prove his apostleship. He wants to prove that he is an apostle, even though he was not one of the original 12 that followed Jesus around. But he was trying to prove that, hey, what I'm saying is legitimate. What I'm saying is not just another spin-off cult. It's not some weird Gnosticism. It's not any of this weirdness. But I am legitimately a follower of Christ. I am an apostle of Jesus. The first chunk of the book is him defending who he is as an apostle for a few pages. <coughs> the second is a defense of the gospel itself. A defense of <coughs> what is being proclaimed in his apostleship. Who Christ is, what Christ has done, the essence of the gospel. Especially in contrast to what these Judaizers have been proclaiming. And so it's a defense of it. It is a defense of their gospel. It is apologetics in its, in, a, in its own form. And the third thing that he's trying to get across is a defense of Christian liberty. And this is something that grows out of the justification of faith. And so these three things we will see across the span of this book. They come in that order as well. It's like, 
an entire book defending himself and saying, like, hey, I'm an apostle, guys. You can listen to me. <laughs> That's not what the entire book is about. But this is also a letter written to a church. And it needs to be thought of that, that way. This is not like a formal like textbook that we're going through, but he's writing to people that he knew. He's writing to people that he has worked with, and he wants them to want to believe him. Because there are people who in this church are trying to say, like, well, I don't know if Paul really is legitimate. He wasn't with Christ and the Twelve, you know? Maybe he's just making stuff up. And so people, whenever anyone kind of invades a church and wants to... Uh, kind of usurp whoever is in leadership. They want to attack their authority. They, they want to attack their legitimacy of what they have to say and say, like, you know what? Maybe you shouldn't believe them. They just want to start to uh, plant doubt in the hearts and minds of those who are in the church. And so when Paul writes this, you will find that he's straight to business. <laughs> when you see this in a lot of his previous, or in a lot of his epistles, he'll usually like come with a warm greeting, which he does here, and he'll give thanksgiving to God, and he'll spend a decent amount of time just like doing just kind of what would be equivalent of like small talk, of just saying like thanks be to God for our relationships, like he does this in Thessalonians. I love Thessalonians, I wrote on it, and he does that in Thessalonians, he's all like, you know our past together, you know that I spent time with you, and he says all this stuff, which isn't doctrinal, but just like, hey, we have a relationship here. But in contrast, Galatians, he is just right down to business. And we'll find that within the first few verses, he just gets right to it. Because for him, this was serious. Yeah. This was really important. Because his church is getting attacked with things that are lies. K.K., what were you about to say? Yeah, I was, uh, was uh, going to say that uh, when he qualifies himself, wasn't he the guy that was persecuting those Christians? And don't they remember him from persecution and type of stuff? So that he feels the need to, to say, hey, I've changed. I, I am, I have a word from God. This is not my word. This is the word God sent me to tell you. Yeah, that's a very good point. And I am 100% convinced, this is reading between the lines, this isn't like strictly in uh, the Bible, but just assuming human nature. <laughs> so Paul hadn't been Saul for quite some time by the time he was planting these churches. But that doesn't mean people suddenly forget. <laughs> that doesn't mean people are suddenly stupid. And they're like, oh, Paul, you've done nothing wrong your entire life. Oh, we love you. All of your sins that you did in the past, the many hundreds of Christians, if not thousands that you killed. Oh, they're still alive, and they're just chilling over there. They're fine. People would probably remember that. And if you're trying to attack Paul's church, you would probably bring that up. So, yeah, that is actually a good point. And he wants to defend it against all of that, because that would be an attack on his credibility. People say, like, hey... Paul he used to do this, this, and this. How can you believe him? Where did this transformation come from? People would do anything to just sow a tiny little seed of doubt in someone. It doesn't have to be anything big. He doesn't, they don't have to like slam his doctrine and try to go at him theologically. They just need to sow doubt a little bit inside of who Paul is and say, like, is he authentic? He was persecuting Jesus himself, how could he be the person now that is proclaiming him? That doesn't make sense. He was the top of his game. He was super rich. He had everything. He was a Pharisee. He had everything going for him. And now suddenly he's this like broke guy in jail, uh, spread some weird gospel. I don't believe that. And so, yeah, very good point. Johnny? No, I just wanted to say, you know, Paul was very educated. So he knew yeah. the law. He knew what, you know, he, he was, you know, he was taught. Yeah. So even though he Pharisee. And Pharisees, despite all of their pride, and despite all the many, many, many character flaws in them, I will say, they knew the law. They were not stupid. They were smart individuals, despite all the many things, that, of course, that we put on them. They were smart, and they knew their stuff. And so Paul knew his stuff. Definitely. Yes, and when, when you were saying that, just because now he's changed that people weren't going to just flock to him because the problem with us as human beings, I know myself, we don't ever forget. We don't. Yeah. I'm sorry to say yeah. that. It's true. You don't even have to apologize. We never, None of us we forget. We never forget what people do even if we go on with what's being done that needs to be done. We don't forget. We don't. We can definitely forgive We wish people. we could. <laughs> and we wish we could. And some people 
try to do and abuse a lot of substances to forget. We do a lot of things. That, there's a term called escapism that exists that people have been doing forever, where we try to do what we can to escape the mental toll of whatever's plaguing us. Like it could be we're depressed. It could be uh, the easiest one that most people can relate to. It could be a death of someone that we love. And we don't want to cope and face the reality that they're not here anymore. And so we try to escape this reality. And some people will turn to drugs. Some people will turn to alcohol. Some people will turn to the many, many things in the world. Whatever it might be, people turn to escapism to get rid of that. Yes, and... and uh I don't. Wa I used to watch the soap operas a lot. I don't now. I just watch them so long. I don't really watch them anymore. And the young black guy that died, uh, everybody's talking about. Only young and the rest of us. He, um, mm -hmm. his son, they said, uh, passed away a few years ago, and he never got over it. Even though he yeah. played the shows, he was drinking heavily, mm -hmm. and he just died from the drink. He just couldn't get over the death of the boy. Yeah, yeah. I think about 21 maybe or something uh, when he died. A year or two ago. Yeah. And so he died, he's only 51. Yeah. And it's unfortunate when people don't learn how to cope. Because that's when you get into the world of therapy, when people think not only there's still a stigma attached to therapy, unfortunately, but when people go into therapy, they think that, oh, I need to go to this doctor who's going to cure me. And they're not. What they are ultimately going to do is help you cope. <laughs> with whatever it is you're going through. They can't fix you. Nobody can fix us outside of Christ alone. And nobody can change us. Not even a therapist. And what they do is they're giving you the means to cope, to handle, to process whatever trauma you went through and to be able to go on so that you don't kill yourself from the sadness of losing someone, from going through something horrible, whatever it might be. And so, yes. Yes, yes and when you, um, like a lot of uh, a lot of bad things happened in my life when I was young, but uh, and you think you're doing great, and just when you're just doing something happy, boom, it <laughs> comes right back in your mind. And I always just say, oh, God, take that away from me because I need to do, go on and do better. Yeah. And then, then it's gone. Yeah. But, but it comes back to you. Whatever bad has happened, it can, it, yeah. uh, something has to keep it from overcoming you. Yeah, that's right. Unfortunately, a lot of people are overcome by their trauma. Okay. It, it's just, uh, in one of the commentaries I read, it said that uh, Paul went to the, the Gentiles. There are still Jews and Gentiles, that's all, right? Yeah. So the Jews were considered Israel, Israel was Jewish? So, with that, culturally, there are still, those who were Jewish saw non-Jewish people as Gentiles. Okay. Yeah, that's how it was. But, so he didn't go to any of Israel. So what he did was... And we'll, we'll get, also get to that in Galatians. Oh, okay. <laughs> There's lots of things I want to say now, but I'm like, ah, it comes up in Galatians organically. And so I don't want to get too ahead of myself. <laughs> because I'll wait, I'll wait. There, There's a whole bunch of stuff to, to get to in Galatians that are fantastic. Mm -hmm. And so getting back onto the, the main track, there's a nice little tangent. Uh, let me actually now get into Galatians after I've given a, a little bit of context. And so different from Proverbs... Um, thankfully, each verse isn't a scripture, or a scripture, isn't a sermon. <laughs> While in Proverbs, every uh, verse could be a sermon. <laughs> and so that's how and why when we went through Proverbs, we would usually just do one verse at a time because we would get so caught up in everything that there was to get out of one verse in Proverbs. Thankfully, in the case of Galatians, that isn't it. And so there's a very strong chance not making a promise, though. Uh, there's a very strong chance we'll get through more than one verse at a time. And I, I look forward to that. Uh, all right. So Galatians 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men, nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. So that right there is already Paul trying to defend himself. We see that, that from the, from the get-go. He is defending himself. He is saying that I, Paul, am not sent by a man, nor men. Because that's something that people would do to try to discredit him. They say like, oh, who's just sent by X, Y, and Z? 
he was just paid off by this person or that person to proclaim yeah. this and that. Yeah. People will try to do anything to discredit Paul. And so the very first thing he says, I'm sent here not by man, not sent by men, but I'm sent by Christ Jesus, the one who was raised him from the dead. He's immediately, and that's one of the, the three things that I was, I was talking about that Paul tries to do in Galatians, the first major one being to defend himself, to show his credibility of who he is, of who he represents, of who he is about. <coughs> so verse 2 says, uh, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me. To the churches in Galatia, verse 3, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave, so in verse 3, of course, don't need to pause that much on it, but uh, that's a pretty standard greeting that he gives to a lot of the churches and a lot of the individuals that he writes to. He says, grace and peace. That's a very Paul, Pauline-like greeting <laughs> for, him, for him to do. Verse 4, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. And one thing that I, I like about that in his defense of himself and something that is always just so comforting in its own right and reassuring is that one phrase that he uses, <laughs> to rescue us from the present evil age. Paul, we cannot never forget, is just a human. He's just a guy. He represents Christ, of course, yes. He is an apostle, yes. But he's just a human. And he doesn't have infinite foresight. <laughs> and so when he says that, we hear that, now, we can definitively say we've heard that in Bible times, and we still hear today. People say, oh, this evil age we live in. It was an evil age even back in Paul's time. <laughs> There's always stuff going on in the world. The enemy, our adversary, is always after the hearts and minds of those who are unwilling to open themselves to Christ. Always. And there's always going to be evil rampaging out there. And for those of us who choose to believe in Christ, we're the ones who are called to combat that evil. But it's just for this, it's comforting to know that, you know, we are not more or less evil than before in, in terms of humanity and what we're doing. It's always there. Done. Yeah, and, and you can say this, uh, what he's saying here, you can say that with confidence, too, because he had that encounter with Jesus mm -hmm. on their road to Damascus. A hundred percent, yes, mm -hmm. and that's how he himself was converted. <laughs> he does not have doubt. Right. He does not have, like, a, mm -hmm. am I representing yeah. Christ? Mm -hmm. But no, there's some dude on the street oh, blinded him. <laughs> and just pretty much left him incapacitated yes. for a while, and then he saw Christ, yes. the living God. Yes, that would leave a lasting, lifelong imprint on someone. Absolutely. So yes, the road on Damascus was transformative for Paul in every single way. Um, very good point, Johnny. Thank you. But yes, yeah, so back then, it was an evil age. Yeah. Still is. <laughs> We're still combating this. Christ has not returned yet. We pray for whenever that day is. We don't know when Christ will return. Nobody does. Only the Father does, as Scripture tells us. Um, but for Paul, he just said this present age, it just shows that he's just a guy. He doesn't know what the future is going to look like. He doesn't say for this present age and all up until 2018 on April 25th, 26th, whatever. Uh, when the evil age ends or something. He says, no, just the present evil age. Yeah. This is all I can see right now. This is when I was born. This is when I'm alive, mm -hmm. around uh, 50 AD, give or take. And he gave, and Christ gave himself for us right now and for the future. Yeah. He gave himself for humanity. Verse 5 says, to, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so, really, Verses 3 to 5 is his greeting. That's it. That's a very short greeting by Pauline standards. Normally, you can spend a whole chapter <laughs> in a greeting and in thanksgiving of who God is for the relationships they have, for who, for what God has done in his life and in his uh, family's life, whatever. You can spend a long time giving thanksgiving. 
But in this, in Galatians, he does it. That is very short. Two verses. He says, grace be upon you, this, this, and this, present evil age, amen. And right after that, he gets to business. Because this was a very, very serious pressing concern. And as we know, but it's always good to be reminded, sending a letter wasn't sending an email back then. And you can't just send a quick text to the church leader and be like, hey, you need to stop what you're doing there with these uh, this weird Judaizers. Stop it. No. <laughs> he sends a letter that has to get shipped. It could take months yeah. for this letter to get there. Yeah. And not and most people can't read. And so right. this needs to be read out yeah. loud yeah. to yeah. people. Can't get what you can say. Oh, and also, I have to think that uh, he's, uh, the people in Galatia, there were more, more than one church in Galatia. So, and uh, with this Roman, this Galatian people living in this Roman society, um, he had to keep it kind of open because um, this letter was going to be circulated around these churches. Yeah. That this problem was throughout Galatia. Yeah. And not in you know, one church, like when he writes some of those letters, he addresses that, like you said, specifically. And uh, re refers back to the personal relationship that he had with that group of people. Yeah. Whereas in this letter, he put it open so <coughs> that it could apply to a bunch of them. Yeah, yeah. Churches. It's meant to go to several churches in the area. I won't get into it because it's more technical, and I don't think it really serves this Bible study. But there's a for theologians they go into this thing called the Northern Galatian theory, where it's like a, this book was, for many, many centuries, many theologians believe that, oh, uh, Galatians was written to this northern territory covering several Roman cities and churches within there, and then they started to believe, like, oh, maybe it was southern Galatians, and it's just, it's like it doesn't really change what he's saying, but right. yes, it, the, the point I'm trying to make is it's written to, to several churches, and it's meant to be read out loud, and it's meant for everyone who wants to hear this. Okay. Thank you, Katie. That's that a good point. Yes, it wasn't just for, for one church. It was meant for a lot of people because this is something that was rampant. This is something that was all over the entire country, the region, just everywhere it was going out. And so he needs to, to combat this. Um, and so he gives a short intro, and then, bang, verse 6, he is right into it with, the very first thing he does is an admonishment. <laughs> he goes right into it, and he kind of reprimands them. And so verse 6, he says, I am astonished. <laughs> Paul, sometimes I'm glad that you were my pastor. <laughs> He's quick to correct him. <laughs> and so he says, uh, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. And so he starts off immediately by saying, I am astonished. He's disappointed <laughs> that so quickly they desert Christ. And in his, in his humanity, that disappointment is reasonable, I think. It's like how he corrected them, that's his own style. Unfortunately, some pastors and some leaders today think like, oh, Paul modeled correction so perfectly and so well. I'm like, mm, I don't know if he did. Uh, and, and it's a different context for a different group of people. And it also was for a large group. It's like one-on-one, -on -one, he doesn't say, like, I'm astonished at you, Miss Johnson, for how quickly you left the faith. <laughs> no, this is to be read to churches everywhere, and thousands of people that he's saying, I am astonished of all of you who are here right now. And how quickly you deserted the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. And so, yes? So, uh, this gospel that they're talking about, that they, uh, the way mine reads, is a little different. It says, what, so, what translation well, do you have? The internet. <laughs> <laughs> What's it say? Um, it, it, it says that um, he, he was um, surprised at how quickly they are slipping away from the gospel. So, if they're slipping away from the gospel, or the one that the, they're deserting Christ, they had something that was good. Yeah. Paul gave it to them. Yeah. And so, when he left, and now he's coming back, and they're saying, he's saying, well, where'd you get that from? Yeah. Who told you that? Yeah. I didn't tell you that. Yeah. That's exactly and, what it is. So, okay. So, what happened is, like, Paul came on one of his missionary trips, he's on a timeline, he comes to Galatia, and he spreads the gospel, he plants churches, mm -hmm. 
and this, these are churches that have a doctrinally sound, they're preaching Jesus Christ. They're good. They're good. He planted, and as any good church planter, let me rephrase that, any church planter that does something ideal, they plant a church, they train up leaders, and they leave. They don't stay there and like hollow the church because they want to plant more churches. Not everyone's called to be a church planter, of course. Some people are called to be a pastor and stay with the church. And so he trains up some pastors, he trains up leaders, and he says, this is what we're teaching, this is the doctrine. He teaches it all to them so that they know. And he leaves. And while he's gone, uh, in the churches, there are these Judaizers that come in and they start spreading their false gospel and people start believing it. And then Paul gets wind of this and, it, and he's like, I didn't teach that. He's yeah. like, that's not Christ. What is this weirdness that's getting mingled into the gospel of Jesus Christ? This can't stand. These aren't churches of Christ if they're getting this weird stuff bled into them. This isn't it. I need to correct these things so that they know what we teach, so that we know where we stand, so that we know this isn't right, what is being preached. And so that was this letter. This letter comes to say, like, hey, I've heard this stuff is going on in here, and it needs to stop. I've heard this stuff is uh, being taught, and it's wrong. And here's why it's wrong, and here's what we believe. And so that's what this letter is. It's something, as I stated earlier, it's very, it's doctrinally oriented. And so it goes very to the, the facts of this is what we believe as Christians, and this is what Christ did, and these are the ramifications of what Christ did. And so that's what this entire letter is about, is trying to, to set people back on the right path, because they're starting to skew off. Some people have left the faith, but as a whole, the church is starting to skew off, and he's trying to straighten them back up, right. and get them back to where they should be for what he was teaching them originally. And so that's what, that's what this is. And so he, he starts off as I was saying, very stern. Uh, and he says that I am astonished <laughs> at what, that how quickly you have left the faith. And uh, it's hard to say how many years have exactly passed, but it's been a decent amount of time. But still a short amount of time where it's like, so quickly, relatively speaking, because there are churches that stand for hundreds of years. Uh, they're fine. They teach the same thing all throughout their existence. But this church, relatively speaking, wasn't there that long, and they're already starting to yeah, veer off and get a little weird. They're starting to throw in a few legalistic uh, tendencies. They're starting to throw in a little like mosaic law and uh, some other things that, hey, as Christians, we don't believe this. This is not what we stand for. And so he's disappointed because he thought like, hey, the people I trained, I thought you knew this. I thought I taught you and you demonstrated to be a leader presuming Paul is a good church planter. <laughs> I trained you and you demonstrated that, hey, you can handle this uh, and you are capable of this. And when we look at uh, like First and Second Timothy, when he trained up Timothy, uh, he was with him for a while and we can presume that he taught him everything that he knew and he sent him off. And so the, the same in some circumstances could be said for whoever the leaders were here. He uh, definitely didn't have as intimate of a relationship as he did with Timothy, um, but he still trained them. And so he's just surprised at what's going on right now. Steve. Yeah, I appreciate what you said earlier about the three things that Paul is defending. Mm -hmm. You know, you started off by saying that he's defending his own apostleship, first mm -hmm. of all. And then he goes into what we're looking at right now, he's defending the true gospel. And it comes to mind how he's astonished at what's happened the gospel he preached is no longer is being perverted. Yeah. Um, and it strikes me that the way to make this possible, you know, once Paul leaves after he's established the church, the only way for a false gospel to seep in is first you have to discredit yeah. Paul. So if you discredit, oh, he didn't know what he's talking about. You know, he was, he, he forgot what yeah. that was all about. So you don't need to listen to him. I mean, what did Moses say? I mean, look at all the miracles of Israel. Yeah. You know, and so they, they try to pull him pull him away from looking at what Paul has done, discrediting him. Yeah. And if they discredit him, then they can. It's easier for them to assert themselves as authorities. Yeah. To preach the perversion yeah. of the gospel. Yeah. And that brings up a good point. That uh, one thing to note, as Steve was saying, that that's the first thing people do 
is they attack someone's credibility in a leadership position. You're not going to directly, it would be, if you were someone trying to bring down uh, a leadership, the dumbest thing you could do is go up in front of everyone and say like, hey, uh, we don't believe in Christ, we believe in this God, right? We believe in Zeus right here. And let me show you why Zeus is real. No one's going to believe that. But first you start with a lot of subterfuge. You start with a lot of subtlety and attacking the credibility of the leader. And why this would work is because in these churches, they were converted, of course. They were not always Christians. They did not always believe this doctrine. They were, they were Jews. And so when these other these Jewish Christians came in, they knew where they came from. And they knew that they knew the Mosaic Law and the Jewish traditions. And so it's kind of like if there was a Christian church that, as a whole, used to be Muslim. And then they get converted to Christians, and then someone comes in and says, like, hey, do you remember all these Muslim things, these Muslim laws and traditions? You remember those, don't you? And they do, because that's what they used to be. In this case, of course, they were Jews. And um, you remember all those traditions that we did, right? Don't you miss some of those? Don't you miss doing X, Y, and Z? Whatever it might be. They attack the things of their memory, of what they grew up with, and what they were told to as kids, and that weak part in us is like, oh yeah, I do remember all of that, and oh yeah, that was, those were good points, and so that's how this could have worked, because they were Jewish Christians, because they understood these Christians, where they came from, they understood their past, they understood the traditions that they, uh, their entire world was built on, and so that's one of the reasons how it happened so quickly. So, yes, that's a very good point, and that's why Paul was defending himself as well, because people are just like, oh, did Paul really understand what we went through? Did Paul really get the traditions of what we knew and loved and this and that? And so they would attack who Paul was. And so in this, uh, in, his in his admonishment of people, he's also defending himself because he's, he, as he says, he's astonished <laughs> that you so quickly deserted all of this. And he says that with authority because he knows what he believes. He knows what he preached. He knows where they came from. And he's, I'm astonished that you believe this. And so verse 7, he says, uh, or I guess touching back on verse 6, he says, uh, the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which and I like this, and it's so short, which is really no gospel at all. <laughs> Evidently, and I'll go back, that's a very, some things Paul said are just so cut and dry, and it's just so clean, that it's just like, you can't mistake what he's trying to say. There's some things in the scripture where you're like, oh, what are you trying to say here? But this, I just like where he says, which is really no gospel at all. It's like what uh, happens a lot, unfortunately, in our world is we are told, like, oh, uh, these are false gods, and uh, these are false religions, and these are false, false gospels, and really, they're not that at all. It's like, if you have a little, uh, like a Buddha here, there's no god existing inside this Buddha statue. It's just a statue made by humans. That's it. There's only one god, and the rest are just things made by humans. <laughs> if someone makes an altar to Zeus, Zeus doesn't suddenly exist there. It's like, oh, look at this false god that exists in this temple named Zeus. Zeus isn't there. Zeus doesn't exist. There's only one God. There's only Christ Jesus. That's it. And so when he says, this is no gospel at all, this is no, which is really no gospel at all, he's saying that this isn't even a gospel that is trying to be preached right now because it's not pointing to a, a God that exists. This is non-existence that you're preaching right here. But what we're preaching is a living God who is active, who was here 15, 20 years ago, who blinded me on the street when I was just walking, minding my own business, I encountered this living God. No one here has encountered Zeus when you're just chilling out here. No lightning bolt comes struck you. Hercules, his half-son, that's just a story. All of those people, they were man-made stories. They did not exist. So these gods that you're afraid of are no gods at all. And this gospel, then, is no gospel. <laughs> at all. And so I really like that statement that he says. He's like, which is really no gospel. He discredits it 
completely. He doesn't say like, well, there's some truth to it. There's a little gospel to that. But our gospel's better. No, he says this is no gospel. This is there is no competition between the gospel of Christ and anything else because only Christ exists as God. Only him. Everything else at best is man-made. At its very, very best, it's just a man-made story that someone invented to explain why the sun rises or something. And they're like, oh, this sun god is why the sun rises every single morning. And the moon god is why the moon rises every morning. No, those are just made by people. Those quote-unquote gods do not exist. And those gospels that preach those gods don't exist either. And so that sentence right there, in my mind, is a fantastic one because it says so much in such a little amount of words. And so going on in verse 7, he says, Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion are trying to, and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. And that's exactly what's going on. He is laying out to them what's happening right now because a lot of people aren't even aware. And that's when someone's trying to pull the wool over your eyes and trying to trick you, that's what they want. They don't want you to know that you are being tricked right now. One of the, the sayings I like about our adversary is that the greatest deception he ever did was convince the world he didn't exist. And we see that in the midst of this, where you don't realize what you believe is wrong. You don't realize what this person is telling you is full of lies. <laughs> It's full of nothing but their own understandings of something that doesn't even exist. And Paul is very strongly, this is within the first two verses of past his greeting. And his greeting was short. Just two verses, he's all like, I can't believe you believe this after I've been gone for a few years. And not only that, what you believe doesn't even exist. It's not even a gospel. They're perverting the message of Christ. That's what's happening to you right now. He is straight out of the gates, in your face. Yeah. You're wrong. I can't believe you believe this. This is nothing. And he's very in their face about it. <laughs> he's not hiding this. The reason being is because Paul, especially someone like Paul who encountered Christ, blinded by him, <laughs> decap or not decapitated, uh, um, completely... Um, just taken out for a few days by him, he knows who Christ is. He has seen and encountered the living God. And not only that, he understands the grace that comes and the justification through faith. He understands this, and he sees how amazing this grace is, and how amazing this gospel is, and how nothing man-made could ever compare to this gospel of Christ. And when he hears of people believing all these random things, where it's like, oh, you have to obey the law to be saved. That's where salvation comes from, obedience to the law. It's like, why would you believe that? This is, in every way, not only is that wrong and leads to nothing, but this is so much better in every single way. And so he is very passionate about this because people are subjecting themselves to something so bad it's so horrible, especially when you compare it to the gospel of Christ. It is terrible. There is nothing nice about what they're believing. But just because they had a history of these traditions, they had a history of the Mosaic Law, they had a history of all these cultural things that go on, they have a weakness to it, intrinsically. They are just inherently weak to like, oh, I remember all that. Oh, yeah, I remember all this and that. But if you wanted to... If you went into that context and someone said, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to come here and I'm going to start preaching Hinduism. And I'm going to start saying, like, do you remember all the Hinduism we learned as kids? No, I don't remember any of that. I remember the Jewish cultures we learned. <laughs> and then weakness to that, but not other religions that exist. And so he's combating those actively. And we see that within two verses of his um, of this letter starting. Like, right after the introduction... He just gets right to it. In verse 8, he says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. There is a... There, there are 
are times, I've said this before, where I really like the, the message translation. And sometimes it's like, in this, thankfully, Paul said this very nicely. There are some times where Paul doesn't say things completely concisely. <laughs> and there are times where it might have just been a fact that it's been translated over the many centuries. Um, but sometimes I like the message translation. And I think that everyone knows that <laughs> by now. I've been saying that for many years, that I, I like the message translation. And there are times where they hit the ball, and sometimes they completely miss the mark, and they just they fumble, and they just, mm, that didn't come out good. So I just want to reread what uh, he just said, but in the message translation. It says, I can't believe your fickleness. How easily you have turned traitor to him who called you by the grace of Christ by embracing a variant message. And that's accurate. As he said, it was a perversion. There was some similarity, and that's how people were getting sold on this. That they said, like, oh, yeah, we believe in Christ Jesus. We believe that he died and was resurrected. Oh, yeah, we believe that. But what do you also think about this right here? It's like, what, what, what would you think if I told you this? It's like, oh, of course, we believe in Christ. But also, let's think about this over here. And that's how they would get people. It's a variant. And that's how cults also exist. There are lots of cults uh, that are in existence that I've read up on. And a lot of them, there are some that actually I've seen on college campuses when I was in CSUN, Cal State Northridge. There's really big cults. There's two really big cults that uh, attack a lot of uh, universities in California. And one of them, I forget the name of it, but what they preach is they go up to you and they're like, oh, hey, we, we teach Jesus Christ. And I remember I was walking home one day, and it was like 9 at night. I was done with school, and like these two guys come out of a bush, and they're like, hey, do you <laughs> no, really? I have no idea where they came from. I'm just walking on a sidewalk, and they just come out of nowhere. These two guys approach me, and they're like, hey, do you read the Bible? I'm like, what? I'm like, I do, but it's night at night, and I'm going home. Oh, God tells us to rest. And so these guys come out of nowhere, and what they say, they're like, oh, have you heard of God the Mother? And I'm like, what's that? And they're all like, oh. Well, let's, let me show you our, uh, our doctrinal verse. It's in Revelation. <laughs> and one thing that you hear with a lot of cults is like, their, their doctrinal verse is out of Revelation. That's usually how it goes. And they're like, oh, see, it says God the Mother. See, that's it. And it was this weird cult. And I'm like, okay, that was weird. And I just left them. And there's another cult uh, along the same lines where... What they do is they get people to come to a Bible study. And in this Bible study, there's actually videos on YouTube of it of people who have left this cult. And they talk about how they're invited to a Bible study. And they're like, oh, yeah, it's pretty systematic theology. They go uh, through the Gospels. It's pretty good for the first half of it. And then a lot of these uh, testimonies of people who got out of this cult are like, oh, but after a few meetings, they start saying some weird things. And... Fortunately for those that got out of it, they could recognize, this sounds a little weird. This doesn't sound right. Like, I don't know much about Christianity, but something about this doesn't sound right. And so they leave, and they find out, like, oh, man, it's this really big cult. Started in Korea, and it's a huge problem there. Um, but how these cults get it, I say all this to say, how they get it is they start off with something that people know. Yes. They start off with something that is very prominent in our culture, and thankfully in American culture, Christianity is still the predominant religion. And so they aren't coming in saying like, hey, uh, do you believe in Buddha? And let me tell you about Buddha the mother or something weird like that. It's like, no, a lot of Americans believe in Christ Jesus. Even if they don't believe in Christ Jesus, they've heard the name, Christ Jesus. And so they're able to use that as a jumping off point. Like, hey, we both can relate on this. We both know the name Jesus Christ, right? Oh, well, let's talk about him for a little bit. And then over weeks and months, they're like, oh, yeah, this is all stuff that I've heard and known. And, oh, this is great. And then it's like once they've built that trust, they built that relationship, that's when they start seeping in the, the weird stuff here and there. And it's like you're so into this relationship and what they've been teaching. You're like, you know, they've been right this, this far. This so far, I guess this is right. Why not? It yeah. sounds plausible, I guess. Why not? And it just goes from there. And so as Paul's saying, this is a very message. This is a perversion of the Christian gospel that we know. It bears some similarities. 
and it bears some things that are familiar, but at its very core, it is not it. And it is a perversion. It is a variant. So, continuing on in the message translation, it says, it is not a minor variant, <coughs> you know, it is completely other, an alien message, a no message, a lie about God. And so in reality, in what they're preaching, it was similar. But in how Paul's trying to address a huge myriad of churches and thousands of people, he's not going to like mince words and be like, you know, there is some similarities in their gospel, absolutely. And they know some things, but then they get all weird. No, he's being very cut and dry, saying like, no, this is wrong. <laughs> This is not a message. This is completely, this is an alien language, as it says in the message translation. This is a no message. This is a non-gospel that they're preaching. He wants to show them the severity and the gravity of what is being preached to them in this moment. And then it says, those who are provoking this agitation among you are turning the message of Christ on its head. He said, let me be blunt. If one of us, even if an angel from heaven were to preach something other than what we preached originally. Let him be cursed. <laughs> and so he's just stating that who Christ is, the message he preached, he's putting his life on the line and how he's saying this in such a serious tone, like, what I preached was Christ Jesus. I encounter him. I know exactly what I'm preaching. I know that I know that I know that Christ is the one and only Savior. And if you hear something, even from something like an angel comes down and says like, oh yeah, have you heard of Christ the mother? No, that is a lie. And he's just stating that even if you see something fantastical and they say other than what was preached to you originally, it's wrong. And that's a very bold statement for someone uh, like Paul, or just a person <laughs> to proclaim. There has to be serious conviction behind what is being stated to proclaim something so bold like, I wouldn't even proclaim that because I'm like, oh, I'm sure I've fumbled my words here and there. I'm sure I've said something that is not 110% accurate. I'm sure I've said something that might have been like, oh, oh, I read that wrong and I misunderstood that. But I said it was true anyway. I wouldn't say everything I said was 100% gospel. And if you hear anything that diverges from what I said, it's a lie. <laughs> Paul had such conviction, and we see that so flagrantly in these first few verses. Now, I would love to go on, but it is 1235, <laughs> and every single time, as Steve said to me this morning, nobody's watching the clock when we have these Bible studies, but I am. And I want to keep us on track with our time. Um, and so that was simply the, the intro to the intro of Galatians. This is an amazing book. And you can already see how strongly Paul is against what's being taught. And the gospel of who Christ is is so clearly proclaimed in this entire book. And so I encourage all of you, if you enjoyed this, please come to our Bible study. Uh, if we're not doing anything like a big party or some event, have it after church uh, every time and it goes about an hour. It's fantastic. There's always conversation and it's always extremely enjoyable. And so we will continue this next week. We have finished up to verse 9. That's where we will pick up next week. Fantastic. We got through nine verses. Look at us getting through a decent amount, more than one. And that is nine times our average. So good job, everyone. Okay, let me close this with prayer. Father, Son, and Spirit, we just come before you this afternoon. And God, I thank you so much for today. And I thank you for my family here. And I thank you so much for your apostle, for your son, Paul, for what he did so many centuries ago that he wrote such a bold proclamation of who you are in the book of Galatians, God. We thank you that we know this is true, God. We know that you are the risen God, that all salvation, any salvation, comes through you only, God. We thank you that even small things that other gods do not exist, that they're just man-made stories, that we don't have to be confused because there is only one God, and that's you. We thank you so much for all the, the wisdom, the information, the doctrine that has been left 
for us in, in Scripture, God, and I just pray your blessing for all of us as we go back into our world, as we do our own study, as we do our own dive into Scripture, and we come back and we talk about it, God, I just pray your blessing over all of us as we do that on our own. I thank you so much, God, for everything that you have done for us, that you are actively doing for us in our present day, every single day, and what you will continue to do for us for eternity, God. And we just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.